Um, all right, we are going to call this meeting to order. It's 4 o'clock, November the 13th. Um, we have an agenda and a couple of things to follow. Um, first thing that we are going to do is we are going to take care of signing minutes from our last, not, excuse me, not the special meeting, but October the 7th meeting. We have been emailed copies of that. Do it. Yeah, I email email to send to sign, and then I will be happy to. You need to send them. Oh, to sign. Either one, we can sign. Okay, we have seen these and edits, so I will take a motion to approve the minutes from October the seventh. I make a motion to accept the minutes. Okay. 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 <coughs> I'll take this. Are you going to second? Second. Yeah. Did I'll you second? Oh, well, I'll take that one. That one. I'll take that one. I'll take that one. I'll take that one. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Okay. From here, our next topic is the formal election complaints hearing. Um, the complaints that were presented to us on the October the 22nd meeting. I am going to let Zach start so, that discussion. Yeah, I just want to kind of, I'm going to take this a little bit out of order for, um, from what I think is on the actual agenda. But before we go into any detail about anything specific, um, I know that there was a kind of ongoing investigation that occurred uh, relative to some allegations about absentee ballot applications and an issue involving uh, Ms. Gasway, who's here with uh, our attorney, Mr. Dove. I have had an opportunity to review um, the video footage, um, the alleged you know, statements um, about what occurred, and you know, they were reviewed under the powers that the election board has pursuant to Indiana Code 3-6-5-31, um, which permits an expeditious investigation when there's a substantial reason to believe an election law violation has occurred. Um, after my review of it, and just coming from the standpoint of an attorney, um, and I'm not saying that I am the prosecutor in this county, I'm obviously not, um, and I'm not trying to say that I'm standing in his place or making any kind of uh, from any place of authority. But again, I think it's my, I think similar to what a prosecutor has to do ethically before they file a charge, um, make a statement about whether or not they feel that there is an ability to prove the case. Um, and it's my belief that based on the evidence that exists, the video footage um, of the incident, that there was no election law violation whatsoever, um, that there was no, um, no culpable mental state for any of the parties, and that it's my advice that the board, um, you know, make a finding that basically there, there was no violation and there is no need for hearing at this point. That's my recommendation. Okay. Could we see the evidence? Or you mentioned the no. parties involved? No, you can't. Okay. And can you just detail one more time to the group which complaint you're referring to? Because I don't think you the said specifically. There was a complaint specifically about. Um, absentee ballot applications that were filled out, not filled out, that were turned in directly to the clerk's office by Ms. Gasaway, um, and that is the complaint that I'm talking about. Uh, there was allegations about issues with affirmations that were made in those ballots. Um, here's what I would suggest as it relates to those affirmations. I don't know why the Secretary of State form has certain information on it that is not the same as the statute, but it's not. Um, and there was no affirmation that was, um, I think, contrary to what the facts were. So there's no issue on that. 
regard in my mind. Um, and as it relates to any of the issues that were raised about, you know, dates and things like that, I do not believe that there was an election law violation, and that's as far as I'm willing to go on it. Okay. So that means we ask questions. That's my personal that. and professional <laughs> opinion about the situation. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that reasonable minds couldn't disagree, but I've reviewed it all, and I do not believe that any jury um, would find that there was any credible evidence to say otherwise. And I will say I've reviewed the video as well, and I felt like if I do agree with that statement or those statements, because if you were to take this any further, you'd be looking at multiple people for multiple different things. That would cancel not, things out. That's, that's not why I made the decision. My decision is based on whether or not the individuals involved had any form of culpable mental state. And that is the distinction between criminal uh, that is a necessary prerequisite for criminal liability, is a culpable mental state. And I do not believe that there is anything that rose to that level. And in fact, I think the evidence would be quite the contrary. I know when I seen the video, I was very disturbed from what I've seen. Very shocked. Because none of it makes sense. Just saying, that's just me. It don't make sense. Um, I'd like to ask questions, but if that's uh, um, involved. Well, again, that's my opinion. But if you're, if you're saying you, can, you can't, then I won't. But no, you, I'm not saying you can't. You can. That is my opinion that you should find that there was no election law violation. You said that you've had an opportunity to review the footage. If you disagree with me, that's perfectly fine. Um, but in order to go any further, I think that you should probably put it to a vote about whether or not um, you even want to move forward with any type of hearing. If you want to ask questions, now is the time to do it. I'm saying we have to look at it, not to ask questions. So I agree with his opinion. So you can take Shut up and go. <laughs> That's what you want to do. <laughs> All okay. right, what do you want? I think, based on what I have seen and the evidence that has been presented from investigating the complaints from the hearing we had the first time, I do not see election law violation. I agree with Zach's statement. Um, I think there are other matters we need to discuss in this hearing besides that, but as far as that recommendation, I I agree with that. So I do think we need to take it to a vote. Okay. So we can make a motion if you'd like. Motion yeah. To you make a motion? I do not make a motion. You can. I can't hear you. I can't hear you either. That's what I just said too. I couldn't hear you. We need a motion to have a vote that we do not find that there was an election law violation and we are done with that matter. Do you have questions, Teresa? I do, but apparently it's something that we're going to have to. Well, you're a board. I mean, you're 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 one of three. If you have okay. questions, you can ask. I them. have questions, but I, I'm afraid you're going to say that it has nothing to do with. I may. <laughs> <laughs> I think if it's wrong, we will tell you. I know. Um, I'd like to hear from each of the three individuals that was involved in that. I guess for to make a determination yourself. Okay. So again, I I am suggesting that you have one member who's made one conclusion after watching the video. I would suggest that you vote on whether you need a hearing or not. And at that point, if you do, we can go forward with that. But I stand by my opinion. Zach, if it'll help, I'm willing to address this lady's concern. If, 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 that, if that will help you understand what our position has always been with regard to these documents. If that's, is that okay with you? Can, it might help you. I don't intend to let Ivan address anybody. That doesn't help, but I, I know exactly 
-hmm. what the circumstance here is. I know what your problem is for future reference that hopefully helps the board and, and helps keep the, the integrity of, 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 of your elections intact. And by the way, I'm Mark Dove. I'm an attorney from North Carolina, <coughs> known Iva for 40 plus years and have represented her and her family for a long, long time. What what is the what is the the crux of the issue here is this day that was that was marked out on the on the absentee ballot application. And when I when I looked at ma'am, what's your first name by the way? I'm Teresa. Teresa. When when I looked at this, it, there, the the fact that that date was marked out has nothing at all to do with this form because if you look at the form, there are actually two dates required. One is the date when the person voted, and that was like 818 of, of 23. The other, and that got marked through, and we saw how that occurred on the video. But that date, all that date meant was that was the date that, that the, the applicant filled out sections two through six on the application. Yeah, I understand that. The date that, that, that uh, Iva wrote in was 10-2 or 10-3. And that was saying that I received that I had I received these in the last ten days, and she had. Mm -hmm. So there's no question about in my mind about that whatsoever. Then when what Zach's talking about, where where she makes an attestation, and I don't know what this is a bad form, and I'm betting that sometime between now and the next election, the Secretary of State comes out with a different form. But it says affidavit of assistance to be completed by individual assisting absentee ballot applications through sections two through six, which I have filled it out as a matter of course because what she's done forever. But it's not it, it, what she was attesting to is exactly this: I swear or affirm under pills of perjury that I'm not an employer of this voter, which she wasn't, an officer of a voters union or an agent of the employer or union of this voter which she wasn't, I had no knowledge or reason to believe that the individual submitting the application is ineligible to vote, which each of the applicants were eligible, or to cast an absentee ballot, and, and did not properly complete and sign the application. All of those things that she attested to were true. So, like Zach says, with regard to this form, there's absolutely no possible way anybody could ever say that she did anything that was a, that was that was perjury or crime in any in any manner, and I think if anything, this whole scenario just kind of sharpens up how you guys do business in the future, so that there is no issue, no possibility of complaint. But as far as doing anything that anyone could could think was illegal, Chris Owens and I have battled things for years and years and years, and and I, I suspect he looks at this just like Zach does and say. But there's no way I, I could ever prove a crime that happened here. So, does that answer your question? No. But, you have a more but specific just, question? Yeah, we're just going to, because it ain't going to give you okay. nothing, right? Okay. You know what I'm asking. I, I thought I did, but maybe I don't. Uh, forget it. So. Well, if there's more stuff that you'd like to know, now's the time. It's not going to be relevant. Okay. I already know. Okay. <clears throat> so I have also looked over the applications that have been in question several times, compared it to the video, compared it to a lot of the information we received from the Secretary of State. I don't think there's any way to prove anything here was nefarious um, or knowingly intentional. So, in my opinion on that particular claim, or that complaint, I don't feel that there's an electional violation that could be proven. So, again, I will make a motion to whatever you said. Okay. It'll be recorded, so it'll be as much. Okay. Dismiss it, or there's no violation. There's no finding. There's violation. no finding of All right, violation. I make a motion, there's no finding of violation. Okay. Michelle? Second. Second. I don't second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any discussion? 
All right. Motion passed. I heard one I. <laughs> I. Sorry, I thought I said I, didn't I? I said I. Michelle? Okay. The next topic is disclaimer on envelope mailers. I'm going to let Michelle talk about that again. Because we had a list of that, and I'm not sure where we're at in that process. But if I mine. So, the. We had a voter bring in a disclaimer about the mailer um, upon receiving the concerns from several voters. Um, I then reached out. Excuse us, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, Thank you. Um, I then reached out. I had a. Uh, uh, I reached out to the Secretary of State about the disclaimer and to the election board about the disclaimer and both advised that it was a state statute and that the disclaimer had to be on the envelope. And the envelope, we have proof that it was not on the envelope because of the mailers that we received from voters for the limit. And again, I don't think this is any kind of formal hearing at this point. Um, it was more of, again, in the investigation stage. Uh, what I would say is that there were other issues with disclaimers that were addressed with candidates um, at the previous uh, meeting. Um, I think that the specific disclaimers we're talking about went out on uh, some mailers that were, I believe, done by the Democratic group. Um, you know, but I want to make it clear that um, when it was discovered that there may have been issues on some candidates' signs, um, those candidates were given the opportunity to cure the issue. Um, they did so. They came in here and acknowledged that they did not have those on the signs, and um, they were given an opportunity to cure. So my suggestion would be to ask the Democrat group that they can demonstrate that either the issue was cured uh, after they were notified or beforehand perhaps or at this point that would be my suggestion okay so we have members of the democratic party here in attendance i'll give you or your attorney the opportunity to address that Hi, my name is Brad Boswell. Um, I'm representing the, the party uh, tonight. So to Zach's point, um, and to echo what the clerk heard, they received, um, you, your office received complaints about the yes. mailers. And it's accurate that mailers went out without the disclaimer. That's true. And to Zach's point, very similar to candidates that had posted signs or done other things without the same required disclaimer. Um, for whatever reason, it really didn't get back to the Democrat Party, like the fact that this was um, an issue. They had actually heard about it through just some like courthouse, I think, rumor mill, and it got back to them. And they very quickly were like, oh my, that's an issue. We didn't realize we needed to have it on the envelope. Inside the envelope, there is a like, here's everyone's picture and you should vote for these people. And that has a disclaimer on it. It's the envelope that was in question. So. They found out through just conversation on the 13th of uh, October, and I believe at that point the clerk's office had had the complaints for maybe a couple weeks, um, and the next day was a holiday. Mr. Wilson immediately reached out to the Democrat co-director at the state election division to clarify, hey, this is, like, this is what we've heard, is this accurate, have we messed this up? And she confirmed, yes, you, you did. Um, and once they heard the rumor, they stopped immediately sending out anything without the disclaimer. Um, and then they immediately put one on their envelopes and then re-engaged um, re their, their mailer campaign. So I'm happy to show you, um, if you'd like, um, we have a mailer here from dated September 19th that admittedly does not have any disclaimer on it. Um, but you can see there's nothing on there. And then once um, they found out that they kind of messed that up, they did October 17th, paid for by 
with the proper disclaimer on the back of it. So, um, yeah, admittedly, this this occurred. This was an issue, um, and as soon as um, they got they got wind of it, they proactively uh, reached out and, and and got guidance from the state and fixed the correction um, within within days, hours, really. Um, and so, um, to Zach's point, our feeling is this is sort of within the you know administrative landscape. This is not something that was nefarious or done with any ill intent. It's just, um, you know, they didn't, they didn't know. As soon as they found out, they fixed it immediately. And um, I think very similar to other candidates that had the same issue in Scott County, um, they took the opportunity to cure it. What's different here is they did it proactively on their own accord. Can I see the um, envelope? Yep, yes, ma'am. So it says specifically printed on the envelope. Is that printed or is that stuff on this is the one without. Yeah. This one is on there. And it is a sticker. It's a printed sticker. <clears throat> Certainly, I think it would um, meet the spirit, the intent of the statute. Not handwritten or anything for that accord. <laughs> Do you know what font that is? Bigger than it needs to be. Seven and a half, I believe, is the minimum. That's for the signs. For the sign. For the envelope, this will be 16. 16. All right, do we know what it, it is? It says 17. On the 17. And it specifically says printed on the envelope, not a sticker. Okay. Well, fair enough. I think what we're saying here is that we, we bought some envelopes at the store and we did what we could do to correct the issue in the, in the, in the time allotted based on the advice that we were receiving from the Indiana Election Division. Um, and again, I think this is a scenario where there was not communication that would have been helpful, I think, between the administrator and the party to, um, to cure this in a way that was satisfactory to you. So they were really doing the best they could with the resources that they had. And when you say the administrator, who are you incentivizing as the administrator? In this case, I suppose it would be the election board. Um, and to Zach's point, it seems like there were candidates that were given some opportunity to say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what you need to do to cure it. And they were given that opportunity. In this case, they had to do this sort of proactively on their own with, with their own effort. Um, Mr. Wilson, you received no email from A.G. Meyer with instructions. Are, I forgot your name, I'm so sorry. Brad. Brad, um, can you please ask your, your client that he received no email from Ms. Nessmeyer before these mailers went out with instructions? The, the ones without or the ones with? The before they started the process of mailing out absentee applications, because this is the thing, there's nothing wrong with them mailing out absentee applications. Right. And I will fully state that I do not think this process needs to go away in any way, fashion, shape, or form. Okay. Um, the absentee ballot application process is there for a reason. We yeah. have elderly voters, we have people who need right. these. I have a problem with this. Um, but I'm, I have been made aware um, that the Indiana Election Division did send out an email to party chairs, to clerks, to voter registrations um, that did have full instructions of this process. And if I need to, I can do a public request from the Indiana Election Division and get proof of that. So I guess my question at this point is, again, Well, my, this is, a mistake was made. Admittedly. And, yeah. I, and this is the thing, is I do not want this board to be a punitive thing. Never have, never wanted. Right. But, just own it if you made a mistake. Yeah, I think they've said and, that they agreed and they, and they did mail things But out. he also said that they had no knowledge of 
the mistake. I mean, everybody is supposed to be on notice of what the law is, admittedly, right? Like, it was a mistake from the first second that it occurred, right? This is not a very, like, and, and no, no offense, but it's not like a, this is not a big national operation here. No. It's a local party that's just trying to get absentee ballot applications to, to their supporters. Um, and they were doing that based on how it's been done for a long time. They're trying to learn on the fly. It's not a perfect system. Admittedly, mistakes were made. Absolutely, they took steps to try to rectify that to the best of their ability. I think, sort of similar to your first agenda item, this is not something that was um, with the mental state of being a criminal act. We're not Absolutely doing anything not. here that was um, with some ill intent or trying to uh, 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 mess with the integrity of your procedures. Um, it's really just something that was done incorrectly, trying to fix it and trying to learn um, as best we can how to do it correctly. And I will also say, as I said in that meeting, that was a special meeting for us because I was not here at our regular meeting oh, the and previous, previous, yeah. my proxy did not feel comfortable making any decisions. Okay. So when we had that meeting, we were not accusing anybody of anything, yeah. but people showed up yeah. and we got a lot of information that day yeah. that we hadn't seen yet. Mm -hmm. So then we scheduled this hearing You're right. for this. Yeah. So yeah. It was, you know, so, it was. I was really surprised at how many people were here <laughs> for that special meeting when we didn't even know what was half half was on the agenda. So I think, understand. Correct. Um, that was a lot of new information thrown at us that day. Completely understand. To to try to cut to the chase on the disclaimers, it seems like maybe there's a feeling that in the future it would be or behoove Democrat club and or party to get printed ballots, printed envelopes with that information on there. Um, and if we can just agree that that correction will continue to be made for future collections, I think basically that addresses the issue at this point. Um, but that's that's my feeling. You guys can tell me if you don't feel it. Man, I'll tell you not. 15 minutes before this meeting started, we were across the street at their office and part of the conversation was using next year as an off year with no elections to really review these procedures and processes and make sure that compliance is of the utmost importance, that efficiency is of the utmost importance, that we're having positive, proactive conversations with the board, with other folks that are working with the party um, to make sure that we're doing all these things correctly with, with Angie and Matthew with the State House. Um, to make sure that we're doing these things uh, in the way that we should. So, and I would just say on behalf of the board, I, I realize you're saying maybe there's some uh, miscommunication or lack of communication that has facilitated it, but it's always possible uh, if you're trying to be proactive to just send an email yeah. or a call and say, look, what are the what are the rules here? And I think the board would be more than willing, uh, and I think it has in the past always try to assist candidates and the parties on how to go about it. And I think, and that's appreciated. I think what was unusual here was they didn't really know because it kind of came to them secondhand and was it real, was it not real? And so they were like, well, let's just check. And it was like, oh, well, whether there was a complaint or not, the, the advice from the state was we did this wrong, so let's just fix it. All right. I think that's the, y'all did fix what you could and right. now we're, at a place where, unless you all have other questions or concerns. Um, I mean, I agree and appreciate that it was fixed. I know, as you mentioned, other candidates provided that opportunity as well, so I, I think that's a valid point. I do know there was a newsletter set out from the state prior to, I think it was in August, I think that might be what Michelle's referring to, from the state with that information on it about disclaimers, so I think it's good to note in the future that you should probably maybe ask your person on the election board if you're doing it correctly <laughs> or potentially if you have questions bring it to the board to let us know before you actually send something out instead of doing it and that could save you a lot of time and trouble um, I also think that um, it was good on your part to go ahead and make sure that you had that fixed I do not know if a sticker is sufficient so that will be a question we will have to ask the state um, so I don't know that I can say that right now. I, and what I'm saying is, it sounds like you all don't feel like 
it would be right now without knowing, but just out of an abundance of caution, it would seem maybe it's a good idea, just so there's no issues, getting envelopes with the printed disclaimer on them for the future. For the future. Mm -hmm. done relatively easy, and that prevents, one, anybody making a mistake uh, and, and failing to put, you know, uh, a sticker on there, but also, um, you know, it, it takes care of, you know, any alleged discrepancy between the, you know, plain language versus, you know, the intent. Mm -hmm. So. And I can say as the clerk, um, with both party chairs sitting here, um, I do my best. I send out date reminders. Um, I take time out of my day to create lists for party chairs that has every date deadline. Um, when I receive stuff from the state, I forward it to the party chairs. <coughs> there were updates on forms this year. Um, I sent both of those to the party chairs. So as the clerk, we are doing our best to make sure that we are communicating to the party chairs in every way that we can. Um, all they have to do is just ask. And a lot of times, if I don't know the answer, I'll be like, that's a good question. Let me get to the state and I'll get back with you with the answer. But at no point in time during this election cycle did anybody reach out and ask me if there was any updated laws on prints, on envelopes, or anything like that. Because if they would have, I would have more than willingly done the research and I would have sent it to both of them because if I email them out, I usually email both of them in text messages and both of my party chairs can attest they are in group there in text message together so that it shows absolute bipartisan. And this has been a law since 2022, actually. So yeah. it's been around for a bit. Two years. Yeah. Two years later. Yeah. So that's all duly noted and fair points and um, it's every intention of the party to correct this and move forward with compliance. Okay, then I make a motion that we accept their work that's going to happen in the future and that the disclaimers will be printed on envelopes from now on and that we grant the grace of no penalties like we did with Mr. Best. A second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion passes. I do want to make a suggestion, um, and I made this once, but I'll make it again. Um, in the future, if anybody would like to do absentee applications for either party, um, there, there could be some sort of training for that. We can't provide that for you as an election board, but there are people who are very good at that in this area. One happens to be Janine Gordon, but she's done it for both parties. She knows the election laws. She stays up to date with it, and she would be someone that I would suggest maybe do a bipartisan training with to make sure you have the accurate accurate information and that you're doing it better in the future. And with next year being an off year, would be a great time to do that as things are getting updated. So again, we cannot do it for you, but we can give you all the tools to do it yourself if you just ask and come to us. So I think that should be noted for the future. Because for reference, July 1st is when the laws come out, which is after the primary, before the general, and it does not affect. So as election board members, as candidates, as parties, laws can change literally in midstream of what is taking effect for election laws. Okay, the next item is date of custody on the I would ask to take the items out of order. Okay. Since we're already on discussions with the Democratic Club specifically, I'll just let the board know <clears throat> that as it relates to the financial and state filings, um, uh, yeah, you, uh, I, I didn't, I can't hear anything you guys are I'm saying. Sorry. It, I, I would like to address the, the item 3C, Democrat Club Financial State Filings. Um, so my, how question, work. my question was, do we need to make a motion to move that on the agenda? Uh, you can make a motion to table the big custody of the previous administration until after the Democrat Club Financial State Filings. 
Okay, I make a motion to table the date of trustee and ADS mail applications and their restrictions until after the discussion for Democrat Club finance slash state filing. So, Democrat Club um, attorney has sent me. I second that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Come on, Zach. You're it's all in like favor? Cold medication is affecting your abilities. We're trying to do the right thing here. That's my Okay. I second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Go, Zach. All right. Go. Okay. So, uh, the Democrat Club has reached out to me through their attorney um, to indicate that they would like an opportunity to. Um, go back and review at what point in time it would have become necessary for them to begin um, filing certain required state forms, uh, the CFA four forms specifically, I think. Um, it's been represented that the Democrat Club is, in fact, a separate entity from the Democrat Party. Um, they, and they will and are representing that they will file those forms once they know exactly when it would have triggered for them to be required to do that. Um, once those forms are filed, I think only at that point would it be appropriate to address any potential late fees um, that would be assessed, very similar to how the board address uh, late filings and fees for candidates. I want to say. The, 12 months ago, I think, or mm -hmm. somewhere around then was when that meeting was held. So I would just suggest that you table that issue for right now. Um, give the Democrat Club an opportunity to, again, kind of make the corrections, and then um, we can address that at a future hearing date yet to be determined um, once those filings are in. Um, and. I think it's my understanding that in the future we'll continue to get those filings going forward. And if I could add just a bit more context, if you don't mind, the, the, the Democrat Club and the Central Committee are two separate entities, that's true. And um, neither Jim or Denny started these. Um, they've been around for decades and decades and decades. They just sort of inherited the system that was set up. Um, it is true that there is money going in and out of the Democrat Club. Um, that would, um, by all intents and purposes, look like a uh, political committee that should file CFA reports. It just it hasn't really been done, and the reason it hasn't been done historically is because they've never crossed the threshold by which you, you've expended or received enough money to trigger reporting. We believe, and looking back just like within the past few days, it, it seemed likely that that threshold was probably crossed sometime in 23. And so what, we, what we're asking, what Zach's talking about, is to go back and say, okay, this is where we cross that threshold. And then from that point forward, get the filings caught up. So it's likely the 23 general, 23 annual, 24 primary, 24 general, and then soon to be, you know, January, the 24 annual. So the idea, but we'll get caught up before then then the idea would be to get caught up, and then you can take a look at those. Um, also, the person that serves as the treasurer for the Central Committee filings has agreed to be the treasurer for the Democrat Club filings as well. So there's someone <coughs> here that's also experienced with this, that sort of understands how the transactions are already working anyway, that is very well equipped to, to do that in an, efficient, in an efficient manner. And we understand that the clock is running, on the 24 general filings, right, fifty dollars a day up to a thousand dollars a day. We understand that's running, so that's probably where we'll start. <laughs> and then it's not a thousand dollars a day. I think a thousand dollars. Fifty dollars a day up to a thousand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So getting that one done and then going back and getting caught up, so you guys can look at them collectively, would be the plan. Yeah. Okay. And do you have a timeline for us on that? That's what I was going to ask. <clears throat> Within two weeks, we will certainly have the one for the general done because that one is like the most immediate I didn't hear for the 24 that. general within two weeks, and then all of it within a month is the proposed plan. 
and the correct filings you need with the Secretary of State to be the yeah. club and your separate entities? So here's what I'd like to say on that, Zach. We haven't talked about this. So tell me, we're doing. I'm doing this on the fly, but files with the Secretary of State is obviously outside of the purview of the local election board. We have every intention of doing that because that needs to be done. Um, and that is a process that includes our goals of incorporation and things like that to make it an official mm -hmm. entity. And so that will also be part of the process. But I think for the purposes of this, we're going to prioritize getting you <clears throat> just the CFA forms. And then, because it's a separate bank account, separate EIN that already exists, um, but then you'll probably register the Secretary of State will be part of the procedure. But I, I do think probably prioritizing this action first. I, I look. I think that that's probably appropriate. I mean, I, I think it looks more right now like a de facto entity. Um, it's operated that way. I mean, the fact that the EIN number exists is kind of indicative of the idea that there is uh, at least federally some recognition that it is uh, its own entity. Um, so. Again, I, I do think that that's really outside our purview, mm -hmm. but I think it would be better uh, and uh, cleaner uh, for everybody involved if, if that was all done. But I think for our purposes, like, you know, 14 to 30 days to get all of the filings prepared is, is I think, not only reasonable, but, but pretty quick in all honesty for being able to put it all together. Yeah. And I think it's, it's good practice to get that done. And that's a very valid point. Um, it's certainly something that needs to be um, shown, I think, officially on paper in filings that these are separate entities, or separate <coughs> operations. And I would just suggest that any issues related to wait till the filings come. The reason I'm asking the table is because there has to be a separate hearing and notice sent out relative to if <coughs> and when fines would be assessed right. and how much. I think that's a whole separate issue that's really not on the table tonight at all. It, it is, I agree. And I think what I was going to suggest was tabling this until we have the appropriate paperwork from the Democrat Club. Yeah. So. Hold on a second. Right. Hold on. You can, while we're in the meeting, yes. Yeah. Can we ask them to go back five years since they've never done this, just to show whether they needed to or not? I don't necessarily know that that's even within our scope authority. That's what I'm asking you. Yeah, I think right. that the issue, the, the right triggering right. responsibility is on the entity as they cross those statutory thresholds. I think you have to, in some respects, rely in good faith on their own like, internal review of the materials. If you find a discrepancy when reviewing the materials, I think you could bring that up at that time. But I, I don't think that we can order them to produce five years of financial information. So. Just got to ask. Yeah. And I would say, procedurally, from just a precedent standpoint, I think what we normally see the way election boards do that, and I happen to be in Zach's shoes, I represent the Marion County Election Board, so I'm on the other side of the table tonight. What, what we normally see, I think, are when election boards audit these filings, they're looking at like the where the because the money's going two ways, right? So it should be appearing on both filings sort of the same way. And then you can sort of see all the, the money that went out on the expenditures by looking at other people's filings. So and, oh did it did is there a threshold crossed here based on these filings? That's 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 really procedurally absolutely. So maybe to answer your question if you wanted to go back and look at what was filed by candidates. You know, more than two to three years ago, you could certainly do that because we should have that information. And if you found that you I did not that. agree with, I have that here. Okay. Um, I think it would probably be important for them to know that so they can cross reference that with their materials. Yeah. And again, the idea that it crossed last year was just. Uh, hey, when do we think, and that was a quick review. So I'm not saying that's exactly what we're giving you. I'm saying it's what we think it is, and we will certainly do all due diligence to make sure we understand exactly when it is. And I will say that um, the Democrat, well, specifically Mr. Wilson, um, did a public records 
public records request um, for all of 2022 CFA4 uh, CFA4 forms that were turned in from the candidates um, beginning of 2023. Just send me an email and get that. Um, then 21, I have some for. Do you wouldn't have any 21s. Um, you have an annual. Yes, yeah. I, I have annuals for those. So, but yes, if, if you need more, then just please be patient because it takes a little bit of time to go together. Yeah. And this may be a process too where they're looking at their records, you're looking at theirs. Let's make sure we get that, you know, and then, then we'll solidify. Okay. And I'm more than welcome, our, our, my door is always open, more than welcome to come in and we can sit down together and make sure that it's all together and done that way too. All of those in the Okay, so with that being said, if someone would like to make a motion that we table the discussion or table the, let me say this correctly, the Democrat Club financial and state filings, that we table that item until our December meeting. That should give you time. I was just going to say, we have a December, what, I'm trying to remember what they have. Can I clarify? I think this is important. Yeah. I think a hearing relative to campaign finance filing fines is separate. I, we, I think we all agree on that. That's okay. We all agree that that's a separate issue. issue Once yeah. we, they just have a meeting in December, well, they'll probably review okay. the filings that are submitted. Okay. Um, so I to be clear, you're tabling the hearing until you get the filings, and then you could. We are. Lose the we're telling you you have we're to have the filings by our December meeting, and okay. that's where we will address this address issue. Address the idea. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. That, that makes sense. I just want to make sure I understood procedurally yeah. what you're saying. Okay. I wouldn't even. I think hearing is like a. Again, like a misnomer in this situation. Our we're, meeting, December, we're our December the meeting. discussion okay. of December these right. issues till we have the filings. If any hearing does need to be set, let me tell you the date. That would need to be addressed, I think. December the 9th yes. is that meeting at 4 30 p.m. Okay. And that's obviously less than a month, so that might be, we'll see where we are, but okay. that would be the goal. Okay, I was just going off your two weeks. So it, well, two for, weeks was for the 2024. 2024? Okay. And you said about 30 ish days to get all of it. Perfect. Okay. Well, let's just make it so where you bring us what you have at that point. Okay. I mean, I feel like if we wanted to, we could move the December meeting to that Friday the 13th. Right. It could for those of you who don't travel for work, but. Yeah. I don't know about that yeah. since it's been on my calendar for. So I mean, if we wanted, if we wanted to do that, we could move that December meeting for to whatever day, like to make it to where it accommodated. Is there a better time in December for you? I guess I'll ask that question. Uh, for the amount of time it's going to take you to get that done. Yeah, it may be. You know, it's hard to say. It's like where it's going to be this day, right? So I think you guys set the meeting. The effort will be to get as much done by that date as possible. Okay. Um, yeah. I say we stick with December the night. You bring what you have at that point. If we have further questions or <coughs> further information or details, we will tackle that at the time. Sound good? Because we can always table it again yeah. to the yeah. next month. We need to. Okay. So can you make a motion for that? So I will make yes. a motion. Okay. okay. I will make a motion to table the um, Democrat. Club financial class slash state finance until the December 9th um, meeting. It's not a hearing, um, so that the Democrat Club has the chance to get all their paperwork filed and get their uh, campaign finance CFA for the 2024 general and um, have that meeting discussion on the 9th. Okay. I second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. So we will see you again for that on December the 9th. Okay. All right. The next item is the date of custody on the ABS mail application that we tabled earlier and voter registration. I'll let Michelle handle this. I have a couple of questions on this too. I see you talk about it. So to clarify, this item B, this is not for the party. 
I do not believe that it has anything directly to do with the Democratic Club or party. It has to do with some specific absentee ballot chain of custody issues. I mean, I, I couldn't say for certain. I've not been able to review anything relative to that. So. So for this one, it is just um, individuals who have brought in ABS applications um, that had multiple applications for voters, and the chain of custody date was not put on any of the forms of when they received them. And it's just that simple. So we have no chain of custody of when the absentee came in. The absentee application came in. And they were turned in. Did you accept them or reject them? So this is at no fault of the voters um, because this was based upon the people that were turning them in. And so um, we did accept them and we processed them so that every voter did get to count their, and have get their ballots. Um, but when I sent this to the state and to the Secretary of State, it is it is for the person that is assisting the voter. And on that very first form, the affidavit, it says um, that they, um, you know. That's right here. I have it on my computer. Um, send in, well, I can, I can, I think I did not bring that form with me. Um, yes, I did. It specifically says um, the date or dates of the absentee ballot application attached to the affidavit was on. So it specifically says when they received that application filled out from the voter. Um, if you receive the completed application from the voter, you must fill, must file with the county election board or Indiana election division no later than noon, 10 days after receiving it or the absentee deadline, whichever comes first. And on multiple applications, there was no date of custody received. And then when they filled out the affidavit um, stating that they're turning it in as for an assistant from our school, there was no date put there. And so I have no way of knowing when custody and if that 10 days was held. Um, that is at no fault of the voter, period. Um, so per states, requirement is we absolutely process every application and we make sure that every voter that turned in that application um, received a ballot but for the people in the, the individuals turning in those absentee applications right. there was no data custody and both the secretary of state and the election division democrat and republican co-chairs and attorneys agree that that is required on that one. And we had so we had candidates in this election cycle fill them out correctly. Um, and we've had candidates in multiple election cycles fill them out correctly. So so basically the bottom line is chair people, before anybody starts doing absentee ballots, make sure they know how to do them. So we don't run through this again. For the record, I don't think any of the Republican Party are in question Correct. They're not. So I feel like okay. since no, but going forward, because yeah, next year's an off year. It's an off year, but and <clears throat> you'll learn something, and then probably the next year they'll probably change it. If you want to see, so this, if anybody <coughs> wants to do absentee ballots, you need to let them know that they really need I to learn. You can everyone yeah, you can have a copy of this as well. And Denny has a copy of several of these. It's where you're where a lot of these. It was all within the absentee campaign that you guys did. So whenever they were turned in, there's a list of several, no one dated when they received them. And I have several of them in front of me that don't have that date on them either. What? There are, the question was about whether or not we can review those in the meeting. Um, I'm not reviewing all of them right now. I was yeah. just looking to see, I had one on my computer to see what specifically what she was referring to, and I showed Teresa because there is no date. I, that's, think, there, that's I think there are redacted versions that we could provide to you guys if you want to understand what the concern was. I think these are redacted. 
There's no social security number on them. Well, I think um, some of them do because of the absentee application, and they, they have to put on their um, their last four of their social, or they have to put their driver's license. And when I reached out to the state, they were like, you definitely have to work out that. So I went through all of the absentees that came in. Um, the version I have says redacted. That's why I said that. Yeah, and right. redacted them. Well, to Madam Vice Chair's point, I think I think she's actually chair. Yeah. Sorry, never mind. For Co. I don't For know. Co. 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 Yeah. I'm coaching. Um, I think to your point, I mean, message received, parties on notice. Whoever the people are that were in that chain of custody, certainly are my clients, so I'm not super comfortable right. taking possession, particularly if they're redacted. Um, but well, they are redacted. They are redacted. But, but point heard and received. And again, based on some other conversations I had with folks over the last couple of days, that was a point that was brought up like in a general sense that there were some chain of custody questions. And there's already conversations ongoing with this team about some um, procedural changes that they could do to make sure that they could limit the chain of custody altogether to try to get them direct to you guys, which is mm -hmm. the most efficient way. But you know, to address these issues, messages received loud and clear. But um, to the extent that it involves any one individual issue, like I'm, I'm not there to represent them. So. Yeah, I was just throwing that out to the chairs. Understood. So that way they could tell the next candidates and yep. so and, on. And that, this is not a new law. This has yeah, that's, been yeah. forever. Right. I think in the future, too, a good way to solve part of that issue it would be to just have them sent directly to the clerk's office as opposed to having a middleman. Yes. I think that yes. clarifies a lot of things. Yes. Um, so that could be something to be remembered for the future as well. Yeah, I think that's good advice. Okay, so for this matter, we're done with people, right? So for this still. matter, we have to, to determine. People? So I mean, so when we look at what Secretary of State letter and you know from the Indian Election Division. This one is, we have to determine if this leads to the, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, we have to determine if there is an election law. I don't think that you can just do that tonight. I, I don't. You have to provide the person who is the subject of the issue okay. notice and opportunity for it here. I think at our previous meeting there was maybe some questions that were brought up, I think everybody talked about, uh, there was information that was provided during the meeting uh, to establish who may have been affected by this. I think if you find any, you know, particular possibility that anybody was involved in your concern as whether or not there's a election law, law violation, I think you have to separate from today's hearing, issue them a notice and an opportunity for a hearing prior to making any final determinations about whether or not there was an election law violation. So then we need to read out the names? I mean, I think that you would need to be able to review the redacted, you know, uh, ballot applications that are in question and make a determination about whether or not you feel like you want to issue notices as a board to individuals to appear before the board at a future date. So, I think we probably need to look over it as a board, that information, um, with each of these ballots, excuse me, applications. Um, so, I would suggest that we do you table that? I would like to table it until we've had a chance to look at that. Does that have to consider the, does it have to be in that local public room and put it in the office? It does. Say again, because you were talking that way. So, sorry. It, it, it has to be it in an open meeting. It has to be considered an open public meeting, so. 
Well, all of our meetings are. Well, I know, but like. I mean, there would be just nobody situations shows up. <laughs> that you could potentially call an executive session on the Republic Records Act, but this would not. None of the discussions of this, I believe, would qualify for that. I mean, technically, I think there's a provision that says that if you're going to be discussing things that are confidential by state or federal statute, you may be able to call an executive session. Uh, but I think if you can, and I think it's already been represented that it's been done, there were redacted versions made that could be reviewed. I think the purpose of the open door law is to be as open as possible. So My thought was, can I just email it to them and let's do it individually and then at the meeting come together? Or does it have to be all reviewed together in a public meeting? Uh, I think you can send that to them and they can review those individually. Are talking about this? <laughs> yes. But it, again, until you... To where it's not, issue, I was not sitting here in a meeting for four or five hours reviewing every application. Until you, can until I you issue that? specific notices mm -hmm. to those individuals as a board to provide them an opportunity for a hearing, you can't make any type of finding about whether or not there was an election violation. Right. We understand that. So we can look over these. And at our December meeting, we can decide if we want to do a hearing. The redacted versions, people. yes. Right, that's so the order we can do that in. Yeah. Okay, it's just a set of sitting here for four hours. That's, we I, I think that's up to you guys. Yeah. So, would you rather, as a board, review this in a open meeting, or would you rather have it emailed? Well, I think that, based on what Zach just said, that's pursuant of like what we're allowed to do for fact finding. And so, just emailing it to us would be sufficient, and then we could table the discussion until the December 15th meeting. And if at the December meeting, you, you know, I'm sorry, uh, you know, iron out or narrow the mm -hmm. scope of what your questions are, and you might know at that meeting whether or not you need to schedule a future hearing and notify. Can I ask a question? Sure. Is this, are you saying voter, the voter who turned in the application or the person who brought all the applications in, the chain of custody person? It's the, the chain, chain of custody, custody person. person. It's not the voter. It's that, none of these are the voter. Well, I didn't, I just was not understanding what things you're talking about. I didn't know. I just The person, yeah, the person who turned it in. Okay, so I need to make a motion to table Same. this till our December 9th meeting. If that's what you want. With the caveat of Michelle providing us with the redacted information that we need to review prior to the meeting. Via email. Via email. Okay, I made that. That will be sent out this evening. We don't have to do it this evening. It's already, it's already <laughs> in a file. Like our, it was a public request. I already had to do it because I had a public request for it. The public document request for it. So it's literally <coughs> in a file, and it will be a, I think it's called a OneDrive shared link thing. Because it's such a large file, it will be Canvas News in one. Okay, Teresa made the motion, so. I second that motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. We will do it that way. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, don't go yet. I don't go yet. I have something for this next topic. Don't leave. You're not excused. Just him. Well, I need someone from their party for this next part because the next <laughs> Jim's like I'm out Jim, of here. Jim's done. <laughs> the question I have is, I know we have campaign finance. The next item, sorry, excuse me. The next item is CFA four discussion. We have um, been given. A list of people who were not in compliance for that. My question, I guess, on this list is towards the bottom. There is one for the Democratic Central Committee and one for the Republican Central Committee for when they were not filed in April. The only thing I can say about that is <laughs> we believe there's an annual report. We're here to bring that up to date. I think there's a hearing. Friday. Friday, correct. We, we should have that report done by then. But I have a question for Michelle though on that because if it was due in April, why is it on the agenda now, not in our spring meeting? I guess we, we were thought we thought that we didn't have anybody who wasn't in compliance. So I and I will I will be very transparent on this. Um, in the December meeting that we had at the election clerks, it was it was brought up 
uh, campaign finances for committees and all of those things, how they had to file. Mm -hmm. You were at the same, you were all at the training. And I was, what started this was Mr. Wilson requested the 2022, um, which started me into a deep dive of all of the CFA four forms. And so I started specifically reaching out to the Indian Election Division, asking very specific questions, um, because I started looking into the laws and guidelines of those. And it has been, it has been brought to my attention that parties, as of like the Democrat, the Republican, during election cycles, they have to file a pre-election, a pre-primary, a pre-general. And on the off, and I actually got the email, but I can read, and then on the off years, which there is no election, which is next year, they, will, they just have to file the one year. Um, and at the pre-primary, pre it was off my radar. I was mainly looking at the um, candidates, making sure candidates, I was calling candidates that day, trying to tell everybody who was, so that they wouldn't be late. Um, and the, it did not go, it did not, it didn't work? It didn't ring on my radar. Okay. Because they had filed their January, they had filed their January annual. So I see here. But well, that is the election board responsibility to keep up on all of those, not just the clerks. Well, I don't think anyone's placing blame. It was no, just a question. Not, yeah. Um, I was just curious as to why we haven't heard that. That's, that. And it was flagged this time, and that's why I'm asking that. So that's something we can take in consideration for the hearing um, that you, we didn't notify you in the spring. And we're notifying you now, but also I don't expect any of that to be retroactive, I don't think, since we didn't notify them in the spring. Um, so that being said, I just wanted to bring that up and ask questions on that for the hearing for Friday, because um, you weren't notified in the spring that you were delinquent and you're being notified now. So um, we'll take that into consideration. Okay. I, I, did not, I have not sent out delinquent notices for, to the parties for pre-primary. I only sent out for, for the um, Democrat, it was for the pre-general, um, for the Democrat party, it was the pre-general. Okay. And for the Republican CFA form, yeah. uh, I did it completely up to this time when it was due, so I can easily go back and take off a few dates and make it compliant with uh, April. So it's already done. That's and it. Turned in. Okay. Because for the Republican, if I'm not mistaken, if I'm mistaken, correct me on dates. Chairman Ward and Treasurer Bomar actually did not take offices until after the annual was filed or due. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a different treasurer. A lot of the time, I do not think the Republican Party had a treasurer she at that time. Yeah. Um, and the Republican Party had a different chair. Okay, I appreciate the information. I just wanted <coughs> to look into that. So we will discuss some of that at Friday's meeting. Is that his name? Yes. Are we done with people? We, we just have. Yeah. And we got a couple other things, but they can leave if. Okay. Yeah, our next our next subject or next item is pending budget approval and county election board attorney retainer. So, if, at this point, if there's no questions, I guess you don't have to stay for this part because it's not anything that's going to be pertinent to you. Tracy, you did send an email to remind you for a reminder about campaign signs. If you want to. Um, oh wait, wait, party chairs. Tell me, if you still have candidates out there with campaign signs out, I've seen several still up. Tell them to take them down because they need to be done within a certain time frame. Okay. 
What? That is not true. What? Well, there is no state law saying that the signs have to be out here in so many days. It says six, six days, and one of the manuals I have. I looked it up earlier. Really it says within six days. I was looking as well. And so I. What? Six days. What? Well, well, then somebody needs to laugh. Uh, I need to I was respectful that. when you said you weren't going to give him the, the video because I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. But Ms. Gassaway's attorney said she they had seen the video. And that is re related to the prosecutor. And if you want to go take that up with him, so you certainly can. I'm so about to go tell the, the, their chair that I'm not releasing the video to him. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I thought you got her <laughs> I don't know what just happened, but all right. Um, Zach and I were just talking about the video. Oh. Um, so. That's what I said, six days. Okay. Just for the record, if there are signs still out, people need to take them down. Um, because the state law says they have to be down within six days. I will get the IC code for you if you'll. I was just curious. I was just listening to whatever. I know. There's an IC code. Uh, I didn't know you could leave. Like, step up. Now, yeah. yeah. so if somebody has a Trump flag or whatever, or a Trump sign in the yard, they have to take it down? Okay. So, or, or we, or whatever. hang on. We are going to have to get into this more because I emailed Brad today and asked him what the how many days they're allowed to leave their signs up and he said there is no state law requiring political signs to be taken down after the election it's up to the local government well it says in the ic code six days but that's yeah. but i will tell you this, and i looked there has been at least three situations with the state of indiana in this whole process where they have said two different things to us where one IC code says one thing, which is typical for the state of Indiana. Yeah. I mean, I'm so we we need that clarification on that before we can answer it because we yeah. clearly have two different answers. Yeah. Because I I had somebody asking me about some signs, and so I reached out to Brad and asked him because I went through all those books, flipping through, and I couldn't find it. And he's saying there's not um, if the county has a zoning or a signage ordinance. So I have reached out to Commissioner Randy Julian, asking him if the county has a, um, oh. yeah. What if you look at the town versus the county? On the country, is it different? Or is it the whole county? Yeah, there is. If you live in the city, there's different ordinances than there are in the county. Okay. So I didn't reach yeah. out to the city. Okay. Yeah. We live in town. Yeah. But, um, but you're talking about a bunch of signs that the people run. This is the people paying the Trump If you have a Trump flag, flag that's different. Yeah, right. Okay. Because this is actually a candidate election sign. Something out yeah. and physically yeah. puts it down, they have to come back and get it. Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 Or you have to give it back to them. Yeah. Yeah. Which we have to find out because, okay. as I was told today, because I couldn't find it in the books. It's in my blue book because yeah, I have it flagged. I'm looking for it. But I have an email from Brad from the state that says there is no state law requiring signs be taken down. Mm -hmm. It's up to the local government. So again, we have a discrepancy here that we're going to have to find out what's oh, really true. No, thanks. Well, we'll. <laughs> We no. <laughs> we will get it taken care of. We'll, we'll find out from the state. Because we have obviously two different answers, but that's not the first time that's happened. Yeah. So. Okay. All right, the next item is pending budget approval and county election board attorney on retainer. That was something you wanted to talk about. So I think we need to go ahead and decide if we're going to get an attorney for the election board and who it's going to be and what it's going to take to we need because we actually need to vote and then we need to get that started so that we have that in place um, I know Zach has been absolutely wonderful in helping us um, I don't know if he wants to officially be our person but I think we've talked about some others um, making them an official County Election Board Attorney. Thoughts, comments? Um, 
Am I wrong? No, you're right. I was just, <laughs> I was overhearing the conversation in the hallway. Okay. Um, not, I was, go ahead. I do, and I know that Michelle has reached out to a couple of attorneys. We yeah. have discussed that. I think the I think the real thing here is that we just need to have a vote on that. Well, I, 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 so I, I did. Um, Unless I, you have more information. So I reached out to um, uh, Josh Digden and asked, you know, who he thought um, would be good attorneys. I reached out to Zach and asked who he thought. Um, um, I reached out to. Uh, Pat McGrath, and because he had he has represented the county election board before, when there was an issue that a former clerk had to go to the state and like was at uh, court of the state and asked Pat. Um, I feel like there's another one in my brain's broke. I do. Anyway, I really, but so yes, I I think we're I think we're on the same track of like I need to, but all of this. Discussion is pending budget approval because if we don't get um, approval for funds and the election budget, we don't have a way to pay the attorney, um, and then we just keep going back in having to use the commissioners. <laughs> okay, so I think we need to. I think we need to find out how much it's going to cost to get what what we need to do to get it. So speaking with um, Zach. Speaking with Pat and speaking with Josh, I um, had just like general conversations with them and said, you know, what, what, what do you think is like a good number? As if you was representing the election board, and so in the election board budget that was prepared and turned into the um, um, council. Thank you, county council. Um, they all kind of gave the estimate between like eight to ten thousand dollars, and so I shot for ten thousand dollars, and we will see what the um, uh, council approves. Okay. So, and that is to have them on our retainer for the year, right. um, for them to be either via Zoom or getting um, email instructions. Um, or if we need them to be at the... I know. I'm just going to ask you not to shut anything up. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, for, for them to be at the hearings, like when we have like actual hearings or meetings that we need, to, but via uh, Zoom or email instructions representation. Um, so. I think we need to vote on who we want to do, who we want to get to be our attorney and then send a formal email to the the attorney. It's freezing in here. Can you speed it up? <laughs> <laughs> then we're all on asking him, okay, so we have voted, we choose you. Um what you know, how much money do you want? Whatever that whatever his retainer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it's probably have you already asked him that question what his retainer would be? I have I have not spoke to or any of them. I'm sorry. I have not I have not specifically. I've had um, uh, uh, Pat reach out to me. Josh Dickton was like, no, thank you, thank you, but thank you, no, thank you. Um, Zach obviously is the commissioner's attorney that he can't do it. Um, but both Zach and uh, Josh highly recommended Pat McGrath. Um, and I spoke to Pat and um, said, would you even be interested in that? And he's like, oh, I would absolutely be interested in that. He sent an email, I forwarded it to you guys. Right. Um, but that's as far as I went. Okay, so yeah. that's why I'm saying I think we need to go ahead and, and do a vote if that's who we want so that we can respond and say, okay, we have chosen you. Hopefully you'll still choose us. Do we do that with that approved budget? Uh, uh, hang on, I think, yes. yes. We've got to know what it's going to cost. And then... Hi. Hi. Is this the room for the reason I'm meeting? Yeah, we're not yeah, there yet. But it's, it's, it's <laughs> we're in a different meeting. I'm so sorry. You're okay? okay. <laughs> I'll just wait out here for you guys. Thank you. Um... <laughs> So we need to start there. <laughs> this has just gone south really quickly. <laughs> there are so many things going on right now. <laughs> because I, he may come back and say, well, I, I only need $2,000. Yeah. 
here's the, so here's we'll the situation. We don't know how much we're going to need need him for, so there's really not a way to put a price tag on that yet. But we I need to know what I it's going to hold him. It's going to take a hold him. Right, if you would, I was going to say that next if you just <laughs> let me finish. I'm ready. I think as far as election law goes, Pat McGrath is one of the top election law lawyers in the state of Indiana, so he would be my recommendation of who we would go with. I agree that we should continue that conversation with him and reach out to him as far as being that for us. Contingent upon the budget, that will determine how much we can actually spend on that, but there will be, next year with it being an off year for an election anyway, we may not need as many services from him. So I don't think that we're going to exceed that amount. And if we did, there's always a way to come and ask for some more. So I would reach out to, I'd say we take a vote to reach out to Pat and have him. Contingent on approval of budget. I think that needs to be very clear that is a contingent that we get budget approval. Because I'm, I'm very, very concerned that we will not have any budget approval. Okay. Does that make sense? When, when are you anticipating that? That is a great question. I do not have the answer for. Um, that is a great question. I do not have the answer. We have not been given instruction. Um, we have not been given any instruction on when the state. I know everything has been submitted to the state budget, and I do know that it was in our budget that was submitted. But I have no detail or instructions of like if the state, when or how or where that they will approve that. Does the state, if if the council sends it in, whatever they send in, does the state change everybody's numbers if they don't like them, or do they just say, well, in order for you to keep these budgets like the department heads did, then you're going to raise taxes or whatever. I mean, do they, I, does the state actually go in and say, oh, you can't have that much, but we'll give you 500, or you can have this? I, that is, I am not a part of the council. That is a great question. I will have to get back to you on that, because I do not know the answer to that. Okay. Normally, normally the process for the department heads and elected officials is we create our budget, we send in our budget, and then they send it back to us of what was approved, usually late December. I think that we should reach out to Pat McGrath to potentially be our attorney for the election board contingent upon budget approval. If something would be different with budget approval, we can always renegotiate what that is with him. Yeah. I think that's where we should leave that. Yeah, so. I agree. I'm very impressed with, I've actually worked with Pat on um, a board and I'm very impressed with him. And if we, this would be a huge question probably. So if he says, hey, my retainer is going to be $5,000, that's what you've got to pay me to hold. Then throughout next year, if we only spend 2000 of that, will that roll over to the next year so that we'll have money on the books with him? For you, mean will it roll over for him? Or no, it won't. But my we guess. Do we use it? Do we lose it? My guess is, is that he may not even do a retainer. He may just do hourly. He, when um, I talked to him, uh, he said that that could be negotiated within that contract, whether it was done hourly or whether it was done like a lump sum or whatever. He said that would be a contract that, and that actually had to go before the commissioners. Yeah. Can he see if you can get that those numbers from him for that? Okay. So, well, I think, that, I think as an election board, you, any of us can reach out to him on those questions. Yeah, I won't be as professional in attorney language as yours, <laughs> but I can do it. <laughs> I think I think we're getting too far into the weeds I, 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 right now. I think we I think we are too. I think we need to figure out if we're going to get budget, what our what our numbers are, and then start negotiating contract after a budget. Because we can change it hourly if we need to. So I would I would suggest what I said originally is that we reach out to Pat to be our attorney contingent upon budget approval if something is different than we think drastically different when we get that budget we can renegotiate and, and talk because we're not signing anything with him yet we're just saying right. yes we want to do this contingent upon and then we can renegotiate we can 
figure out those details and renegotiate that. I think that he will probably do hourly for something like this. It, it actually, and from the way I understand is if the pending, <coughs> sorry. I just thought I just choked on. <laughs> I didn't see you take a drink. I was like, oh. <coughs> um, talking to Zach, um, even pending a budget approval, we will still have to, as the election board, then go to the commissioners and ask to have a contract written up and then approving that we get um, that contract through that. Yeah. Okay. So there's still several. And then. But our court is, am I wrong? Our first step needs to be we need to vote on that we want him. Or yes, we're voting. We'll, we're voting that Pat is who we want. He will send whatever his numbers are to us. What what he wants, mm -hmm. we'll review that. That will go to the commissioners at some point, but all that's contingent upon the budget approval. So yes, we do need to vote on that portion okay. of it for sure. So I make a motion. <laughs> I know what I'm doing now. I make a motion to um, reach out to Pat McGrath. And ask him to be our election board attorney. <coughs> okay. Um, contingent on budget. Contingent on budget. Contingent on budget. Yes. I, I, I almost budget. knew what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I tried, by golly. Okay, so you want to second that? I second that. Oh, did you hear you said it? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thanks, Zach. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, it's because you're the commissioner, you can't have it. Okay, is there any open discussion or questions? <laughs> We are very entertaining, aren't we? All right. If that's the case, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I make the motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Can you this stop on the record? Do I know how to do that? I think you just hit, like, there's, like, a little record button on the right side, and it's, it stop.